Well, good to ask you all today. I'd like to believe so. Well, welcome to this evening service. And uh, I'm truly blessed to uh, be alive and to be well, to see another, or to rather hear another word from the Lord. So um, without further, uh, further ado, I'm going to ask you to deal with me. Uh, we're going to pray, and straight after the opening prayer, we're going to invite our, uh, Brother Chris uh, to speak to us uh, for the last message this evening. Amen. Uh, can I ask a uh, young person to come forward and pray for us, Sister Aisha? If you mind to pray for us, please pray for uh, Brother Chris and pray for everybody who is here. That, uh, uh, the message this evening will find a good soil. Like that. Something like that. <laughs> and we saw the hand of the Lord move as well, did we not? Amen. God is good. Truly is good. Um, before we get into the message, are you yeah. No worries. Before we get into the message for this for this evening, as it has been my tradition, I want to invite you to have a word of prayer with me. Let's ask for the Spirit of God to be our teacher, our guide, and our instructor. Just want to give you 60 seconds to pray silently, and then at the end. You'll hear my voice, I'll close this out in prayer. Sinners to repentance. Here we are, Father, asking. 
seen that you forgive us of our sins, that you cleanse us thoroughly of all of our folly, all of our unrighteousness. We plead with you that you grant us the gift of the Holy Spirit, that you open up our minds, that we might be over one of these things out of thy law, that you open up the treasure house of wisdom and set before us the jewels, things old and things new. May your truth shine through with clarity, so that we might be able to make logical decisions we open our ears as you seek to reason with us thank you for hearing this petition thank you for the ministry of your angels and I claim your promise in Jeremiah 33 verse 3 you said call unto me and I will answer thee I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not father I know nothing I really don't Anything that any man has, he receives from your hand. And so please cleanse me of my pride, my self-trust, my self-righteousness. And I pray that you be able to use me for your honor and glory, dear God. For this prayer, for this, for this gift, this blessing, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. As I was in the um, last session, as I was in the last session, I was um, really was impressed to do with this matter that I'm going to do with this evening, and I'm going to delve into something that I wasn't planning on delving into this evening, but I pray that as we get into this subject matter, that uh, some things will be clear in your mind, amen? That some things will be clear in your mind, and I pray that it will be a blessing to your souls. We're going to go to the book of Revelation chapter 7, we were there last night, we're going there once again. Revelation chapter 7, and we begin at to verse 1. Revelation chapter 7. And we'll begin at the first verse. Revelation chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. The Bible tells us there. In Revelation chapter 7, a verse that I gave you. The Bible says, And after these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, so that the winds would not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice unto the four angels, unto whom it was given to her the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And last night, as we studied the word of God, we came to understand from the book of Isaiah, chapter 8 and verse 16, that what God is desiring to seal up within our foreheads, or rather what God is seeking to seal up within our characters, is His law. And we also came to understand by looking in the book of Exodus chapter 31 and verse 18, Luke chapter 11 and verse 20, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 28, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10 and 11, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 16 and 17, we also came to understand by looking at these verses of Scripture that the means by which God is going to write His law in our minds and in our hearts or seal His law up within us is that His Holy Spirit is going to work on the frailty of our humanity until we are men and women that... End. Are you following so far? Are you going to go? Okay. His Holy Spirit is going to work on our minds. He's going to work on our hearts until we are a people that find delight in the service of our Savior. If you're with me, friends, just say amen. 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 Because the Spirit of God, the third person of the Godhead, He is the one that is the sealing agent. Are you with me, friends? He is the one that impresses the will of the Lord on our minds. He is the one that increases the law of God in our hearts. He is the one that trains us to be like Jesus, if you will. Yes. Are we all together? Yes. And so, I want you to look back with me at the book of Revelation chapter 7, and I want you to pay attention to verse 3. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 3, the Bible says this, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Brothers and sisters, I want you to see what the Bible is telling us there. There's a prerequisite to receive the seal. You must be a servant. Did you see it? We are not sealed to become servants. We're sealed because we are servants. 
Did you see that in your Bibles? Yes. Seal the servants of our God in their foreheads. God is looking for servants whom he can see. Simple and plain. Is that good right now, brothers and sisters? And being a servant of God is being more than one that professes a belief in the Lord. The Bible tells us, go quickly with me to the book of Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Most of us are familiar with the contents of it. Matthew the 7th chapter. Matthew chapter 7. And you can just quickly look with me at verse... Yeah, just look at verse 21. Matthew chapter 7. And let's start at verse 21. When you arrive there in your Bible, say amen. Matter of fact, don't go there yet. I want to give you another scripture first. Go to Matthew chapter 10. I like this. So that you can really see why I'm taking you to Matthew chapter 7. Go to Matthew chapter 10. I like this. And verse 24. Matthew chapter 10. And what verse did I give you now? 24. In Matthew 10 and verse 24, just pay close attention to the verse, okay? In Matthew 10 and verse 24, the Bible says this. The disciple is not above his master. Are you there? The disciple is not above his Master, nor the servant above his Lord. Is it clear to us, ladies and gentlemen, that a disciple has a master and a servant has a Lord? Are you with me, friends? A servant is one that is subject to a Lord. No, no, no. no. Pay attention. The disciple is a follower of his master. But a servant is one that is subject to his Lord. Lord. Excellent. Now go to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. You'll see the point. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Matthew 7 and verse 21. Jesus says this in Matthew 7 and verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now what type of individual would be saying, Lord, Lord? Exactly. If the person is saying, Lord, Lord, they're claiming that they're servants of... Come on, friends, this is not... They're claiming that they're servants of who? The of the Lord. This, he says, not everyone that professes to be a servant is going into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Imagine, imagine, I have a servant and I tell the servant, go, go wash the dishes, and they're like, I'll think about it. Well, what type of servant is that? It's a rebellious servant. It's just a rebel period. Is that correct, friends? That's no servant. A servant will always fulfill the will of their Lord. So Jesus says to us, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone that professes, I'm a servant, I'm a servant, is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Only those who in truth do the will of my Father, which is in heaven. If you're all together with me, just say amen. amen. So number one, brothers and sisters, we know something about servants. Servants don't just profess to be believers in God. Servants, servants are those who obey God. So who is going to be sealed in the final analysis of the sealing work? And servants are those who actually do what? Who actually do the will of God. Not people that just say they have a knowledge of the will of God, but people who in truth perform the pleasure of their Lord. Is that clear enough? Go with me another place in the Bible. This is one more scripture that I really love on this subject in the book of Job. Job. Job chapter 1. Where are we going now? Job chapter? In Job chapter 1, you remember the book of Job, most of you. In Job chapter 1, it opens up, showing us Job and all of his power, all of his glory, all of his riches, his children, congregating together, having a good time, etc. And then the scene shifts in verse 6, because the Bible tells us now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Do you see that in your Bibles? And in verse 7, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Now, did God actually need Satan to tell him where he was coming from? So why did God ask the question? Come on, friends. Why did God ask the question? To see what Satan was going to say. He knew exactly what Satan was going to say. So why did God ask the question? What do you think? Okay, say it again, say it again. He wanted the rest of the universe to hear what he was going to say, right? The sons of God were there, right? 
God knew what was in Satan's heart. He wanted them to hear what was in Satan's heart. Are you with me, friends? He said, from whence comest thou? And Satan and all of his arrogance said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down in it. He basically was saying, just, you know, from going as, as, assessing my kingdom. You know, the kingdoms of the world and all the glory of them. You know that's what he was saying, right? You know, he believes he owns the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. If you look in the book of Matthew chapter 4, when he was tempting Jesus, the Bible tells us that he took him up to an exceeding high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said, all these will I give to you if you will just fall down and worship me. Are you with me, friend? He said, I just came from my kingdom and, you know, observing everything that's going on in my kingdom. And I love God's response because you can imagine I mean, you know, sometimes we read the Bible and we just read the Bible like it's just a book, like this didn't just happen. Brothers and sisters, can you imagine? I mean, I want you to imagine. You know, there's something powerful. God is the one that gave us an imagination. You know that, right? Unfortunately, the devil has led us to pervert the use of the imagination, but God has given us the imagination so that we can try to comprehend things that are not seen. In other words, he sets before us in the book of Revelation all the things that are going to go on in the kingdom of heaven. And with the imagination, we can begin to grasp the glories that God has prepared for those that love him. Are you, are you with me right now, friend? So he wants us to use the imagination. It's given of him. He's very imaginative, obviously, because he made creatures like us. Are you with me, friends? I mean, if you don't know God is imaginative, if you don't know that God has a great ima imagination, just look at Platypus. It settles the question. You don't know what a platypus is, do you? And this is a hard room, brothers and sisters, I tell you. You know what a platypus is? Have you ever seen that creature before? Yes. Oh, it's a very interesting creature. Just, just Google it when you have time. Don't do it now, because I know how you like to Google during the church service. But Google it when you have the opportunity. Platypus, interesting. So can you imagine? The sons of God are there. They're representatives from all the world. So you have this grand council. God, obviously, is the center focus of all of it. And here, this, here Satan comes walking in amongst them. Can you not imagine that all of them are saying, I can't believe this guy. Here he comes. Can you imagine? He just comes walking in arrogantly. And God, and God acknowledges him. So if God acknowledges him, where do you think all the attention goes? What is he going to say? He says, from going to, and he doesn't, and he's arrogant, he's looking at God from going to and from the earth. Walking up and down, you know. <laughs> right? And then God responds, really? <laughs> have you considered my servant Job? Powerful friends. He's like, oh, you, you, every, you have everything under control on planet earth. But everybody's marching to your jungle. What about my servant? What about my servant? Have you considered my servant? Wait a second, what did he call Job? My servant. My servant. Mm. Have you considered my servant, servant Job? That there is none like him in the earth. Brothers and sisters, servants of God, they're different. You're not listening. There's none like the servants of God in the earth. That means servants of God are peculiar. We're supposed to be a peculiar people. Those that will be sealed will be a peculiar people. Has not the Bible told us in the book of Peter, chapter 2 and verse 1? Come on now, tell me the scripture. I'm talking to Bible believers here. What church am I going to? Second Peter, chapter 1. And, okay, open your Bibles there. Open your Bibles there. Where are we going to get our Bibles? Second Peter, chapter 2. No, we're not going to Second Peter. We're going to 2 Peter chapter 2 and what verse? No, it's not even 2 Peter. It's 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Look what it goes on to say. That ye should show forth the praises of him that have called you out of the darkness into this. Paul was like, did God look to Job to show forth his praises before everyone? Yes, he did. Was he peculiar? Yes, he was. There was none like him in the earth, brothers and sisters. So God's servants are supposed to be a peculiar people. There is supposed to be none like us in the earth. Therefore, if we're trying to do what everyone else is doing, we were not seeking to be seated. If we're trying to format our homes, our careers, 
our closets, our if we're trying to arrange affairs of our lives and we're using the same blueprint that other people are using for marriage, for education, for eating and drinking and dressing and living, brothers and sisters, you're making preparations, but it's not to receive the seal of the living God, it's to receive the mark of the beast. Friends, the Bible tells us that when God looked at his servant, he called him his servant. He said, there's none like him in the earth. When people look at you in the workplace, do they say you're just like everybody else here? Mm. Or do they say, man, what's, why are you so different? I mean, it's not like different in a bad way, like, you know, different, like, different. But why are you so different? Brothers and sisters, we need to be different. Are you with me, friends? The world should be able to distinguish us from, the, from their ranks. And going on to talk about his servant, he said that there's none like him in the earth. That he is what else? Come on now, it's back in your Bibles. I want you to look at it. Go back there, Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. Because this is a subject that I really want to deal with this evening. Job chapter 1. In Job chapter 1, go there now if you will. Just look at verse 8. The Lord said unto Satan, Excuse me. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? What's the next word that he uses to describe Job? Perfect. Perfect in an upright hand. God declared Job to be perfect. Let me ask you a question. Was Job perfect? How do you know Job was perfect? Because God said it. Simple and plain. If God said it, then it's truth. Job was perfect. How many of us have heard in our churches today, it is impossible for man to be perfect? And it's so interesting, the book of Job is actually the very first book that was written, and in the very first book that was written, in the very first chapter that was written, God speaks of a perfect man. Is that interesting? So it is true then that man can be perfect. The question is, what does it mean to be perfect? The reason why so many of us believe that perfection is an impossibility is because we have our own definition of what perfection is, rather than accepting God's definition that is given to us in the scriptures. Do you understand what I'm saying? I want to talk about that this evening, because it actually dovetails into something that was talked about earlier this evening, and I pray that you'll be able to see some of this information and potentially you'll see them through different eyes, and that's my hope. If you go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 5, and you look with me at verse 48, these are the words of Jesus Christ himself. Because brothers and sisters, I want you to understand that what we've looked at thus far this evening is very important in reference to this issue of the sealing. And the sealing work is not something that's going to take place in the future. Friends, it's going on now. Do you understand this? Oh, I, somebody just grabbed it. It's happening now. The silly work is happening now. It's not something that's going to happen later. It's going on now. Can I say that one more time? The ceiling is happening now. This is not a future thing that we're looking at in Revelation chapter 7. This is a fulfilling prophecy. Not something to be fulfilled. Something that is fulfilling. Is that important for us to understand? Yes. And therefore... As we've looked in the scriptures, God says, listen, I'm looking for people that are not just talkers, but they're actually doers. They're going to be a people that so that that carry out my will to such an extent that there will be none in the earth that will be like them because they'll be perfect in the sight of the Almighty. So, friends, if we're seeking to be sealed, then we must seek after this perfection that God is calling each and every one of us to experience. Do you understand what I'm talking about this evening so far? <laughs> now, if we're looking together at Matthew 5 and verse 48, these are the words of Jesus. You see them there in the Bible. Once again, anytime somebody tells you, oh, this is impossible, this is that, this is that, 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 you just point them to the words of the Savior, friends. Are you with me? God does not lie. He tells the truth. 
And in Matthew 5 and verse 48, the statement comes forth clear to our ears. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Is that a clear statement? Yes. It's clear. That's a black and white statement. Now, some people would like to jump out the window and say, oh, no, that's symbolic. No, it's not. God said, be perfect. But once again, I repeat, most of us do not believe perfection is possible because we have our own definition and we're not accepting God's definition. Do you understand what I'm saying? So what is God's definition of perfection? Here are three definitions connected to that word perfection. When you look in the Greek language for that word in the book of Matthew 5 and verse 48 that are relevant and we're going to look into them this evening. Here's definition number one. Complete. What's definition number one? Complete. Definition number two. Full age. When it says full age, it means like to come to fullness of age, like to come to a point of maturity, full growth, right? And you get the point, right? Full age. You get the point? Yeah. So what's definition number two? Full age. Excellent. And definition number three, my favorite one, is M-A-N, man. What's definition number three? Man. Man. Perfect there actually means man. We're going to deal with all those three definitions. So let's go with the first one. The first one, what, is, what was the first one that I gave? Complete was the first one. So let's look in the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 2. In Colossians chapter 2, by the way, the book of Colossians is a powerful book. Really powerful book. I like Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 2. When you have time, go ahead and read it. Study it. It's powerful. It will bless your soul. It will draw you closer to Jesus. In Colossians chapter 2, beginning at verse 9, the Bible says this, concerning Jesus Christ, the one who is the image of the invisible God. The Bible says this there. Are you there in your Bibles? Good. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9, it says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Do you see that? So in Jesus Christ, the fullness of the Godhead, in other words, the fullness of omnipotence, omniscience, I mean the fullness of the Father, the fullness of the Spirit, finds itself bodily in Jesus Christ. If you're following, say amen. amen. And then if you look at verse 10, look what it says. And ye are complete in Him, who is the head of all principalities and powers. So when Jesus Christ is in us, or rather, we are in Jesus, the one who has all the fullness of divinity residing within him. Friends, when our lives are hidden in Jesus, our lives become immersed in the fullness of his divine nature. Are you getting the point right now? Did you get what I just said? I'll say it in a different way. When our lives are hidden in Jesus, humanity fully unites with divinity. Did you get that point? And the Bible says it is in this connection of humanity being hidden in divinity that we are now made complete. Does this make sense? Okay. Now let's go to our next one. That's complete. Let's go to number two. What was number two? Let's see if you were paying attention. What was number two? Full of age. Okay. Run to the book of Ephesians chapter 4 with me. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 is a powerful chapter as well because it talks about the gifts of the Spirit operating in the church. You know, apostles and prophets, teachers, evangelists, etc. And then it goes on to tell us for, which, for what purpose God has placed these gifts of the Spirit in the church and how long they need to operate in the church and what they ultimately need to accomplish in us before before we don't need these gifts anymore. We're in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4 and verse 13. Are you there with me? Yes. I'm just waiting for you to tell me you're there, then I'll go forward. Are you there with me? Yes. Ephesians 4 and verse 13, it says, Till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, do you see this development, this growth? Do you see this? Which, do you see that in that verse? Yes. Listen to the listen to the last words. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Do you see the language of growth there? Yes. Development. This is what the Bible is talking about here when it comes to the issue of perfection. 
So we see that perfection as well is a work that is accomplished in the church through the gifts of the Spirit working in us. Did you see that? Did you understand what I just said? This side of the room, did you understand what I said? Okay, I'll say it again. Ephesians chapter 4, you can read the whole chapter, I'm not going to go through all this evening, but you can read the whole plan. In fact, let me give you a couple of verses so that you can see what we're talking about, so that everything is clear. I want everybody to walk out of this place clear in the mind. So, look with me at Ephesians chapter 4, are you there? Okay, excellent. Now, I want you to begin Ephesians chapter 4, and mm, let's start at verse, let's, let's just start at verse 7. It says, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he said, we, oh, let me just jump past this so I don't get you all messed up. Go to verse 11. Are you there? Yes. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now we can see these are gifts of the Spirit that are working in the church. Is that clear to everyone this evening? Yes. Now then he tells us for what purpose now. So we're looking at verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. This is the reason that God has placed these gifts in the church. He didn't make a person a pastor so they can make money. He didn't give somebody... <laughs> he didn't give the gift of evangelism. You get the point. I don't need to go, go to every point. You get the point. It's for a specific thing to be accomplished in the entire body of Christ. That is why no man is an island to himself. God has put us together collectively so that we can grow into a living temple in which the Spirit of God can dwell eternally. Amen. We have to work together in Christ. It's not going to happen any other way, friends. Anyway, we keep it going. Are you with me, friends, so far in the Bible? Good. And verse 3 says, how long these gifts need to work? How long are we going to need evangelists and apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers? Do you think we're going to need this in heaven? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But we'll need them until, verse 13 again, till we all come into the yes. union of the faith yes, and of the knowledge of the Son of God mm -hmm. unto a perfect Man, unto the, come on, read it with me. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So he says, the work of the Spirit must continue in my church until I have a perfect people that develop to be just like my son Jesus. Are you with me, friends? So we see the work of the Spirit of God in the hearts of men and women brings us to a state in which God can look at us and say, that one there is perfect. Are you with me, friends? Okay. So that's full of age. Do you all get that concept now? Does that make sense? Okay. Now, the last one was the last definition. Talk to me. Man. Excellent. Now, man. How can man be connected to perfect? Well, what does God define a man as? Say it again. Say it again, sister. Beautiful. Go with me to the book of Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Let's look at verse 27. Genesis chapter 1. What verse are we going to? You only know this one by heart. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he, him, male and female created he, them. Brothers and sisters. So one that is perfect is one that is restored back into the image of God. Are you getting the point right now? Friends, how are we made in the image of God? Listen to the, listen to the question. I'll say it again. How were we made in the image of God? This is, this is really not a true question. I'll say it one more time. Let me say it one more time. How was man made in the image of God? Say it again. He spoke, he spoke it. He made us. The Creator made us that way, right? Did the Creator make us in His image? How are we going to be recreated in this image? It's really not a true question. If the Creator was the one who made us in His image, by what means are we going to be recreated in His image? By the same what? Come on, talk to me now. By the same. Okay, let me let me say it for you. Let me spell that out. If the Creator.
Raymond was the one responsible for making us in his image. The creator is also going to be the one that's responsible for recreating us in his image. So the only way that you or I can once again be restored back into what God intended a man to be is if he works in me both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Are you following, friends? What I'm, The reason I'm highlighting this the simple reason I'm highlighting this is that every scripture that we've looked at thus far, whether it was the scriptures that we looked at concerning what does it mean to be complete? Well, it's if you're in him, meaning Jesus. Um, how do we come to this point of being in fullness of age? Well, the spirit of God working in our hearts develops us so that we can be just like Jesus. How are we made back into the image of God? We're, well, the same creator that made us in his image is the same creator that's going to refashion us in his image. The point that I'm trying to drive home to you this evening is this. The only way that man is made perfect is if the Godhead is working in us. Every aspect of perfection is God in you, God in me, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Perfection is not what you can do. Perfection is what God can do in you. So when we talk about, oh, nobody can be perfect, what we're really saying is God can't make man perfect. Do you understand this? I'm trying to help you understand an issue that any theologian or pastor that gets up and says it's impossible for man to be perfect, we are literally contesting the omnipotence of God. So the next time somebody says to you, oh, nobody can be perfect, the very first thing that should come out of your mouth, so you're saying to me, pastor, that God isn't omnipotent. That should be your question. That should be your next question. You're saying that God is an omnipotent. Are you getting the point? Yes. Because the question of perfection is not how good man can perform. The question of perfection is what God can do in us. So the next question now is, because we hear this, we love it, We've heard that we have to be perfect. We need to be perfect. We must be perfect. And it's true. God is seeking to restore us back into his image. What is our part in the process? How can it be accomplished in us? How can we have a genuine, real experience in Jesus Christ? Where by his grace, one day, like Job, he can look on us and say, have you considered my servant? Because ultimately, friends, when this whole thing is over, God is going to have a people that he's going to look on and say, those are my servants. He's going to have a people that are sealed, and everyone that is sealed is a servant. And there will be none else like them in the earth. And that needs to be us. I'll say that again. That needs to be us. So go with me now. We're going to look at Genesis. Genesis chapter 17, let's start with verse 1. Genesis 17, looking at verse 1. I'm going to try to weave into some weave into this some things that we were looking at earlier. Genesis 17, looking at verse 1. Very simple. My young people, do you understand what we're talking about? My young people. You get it? You guys get it over there? Good. What about you over there? Young people over there. What do you, you guys get it? You get it back then? Okay, excellent. Perfect. Good. If you guys get it, then that means we're going. Are you with me? All right. And so that's what it's all about. All right. So here we go. We're in Genesis chapter 17 and verse 1. The Bible says this. Now when Abram was 90 years old and 9. And when Abram was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Here we go again. Book of Genesis, a call to what? Perfection. So is the call to perfection something unique to the New Testament? No. Absolutely not. First two books of the Bible, literally the very first two books of the Bible, Genesis and Job, we see the message of perfection. 
The father of the faithful was called to be perfect when he was 99 years old. Now, some of you know where I'm going with this, hopefully. And I hope that for those of you that may not know, just, just, just lock in with me right now, okay? Just lock in with me. Why did God introduce himself to Abram as the Almighty God? Period. He said there's nothing impossible. That's the answer that our elder gave us. Let me give you a quick analogy to help drive home what he kind of said to us right there. Let's imagine, this is the best analogy that I can give you at this point on this. Let's imagine that you are dead broke. Somebody's like, I'm not imagining. Let's imagine that you're dead broke. Are you with me right now? You're broke and you're sitting at home and, and you're broke. You, you, you don't, there, there's no, there's no salsa, there's no, <laughs> you know, there's no, there's no, I mean, you, you don't have a, you don't have a high school diploma, you don't have a college, you don't have a college degree, you don't have any real skills, you don't have any friends, your family members have all left you, you've got a cell phone that is working though. I don't know why, but it always happens that way, right? The cell phone's working. And, and then you get a phone call. And on the phone, you get a phone call from, hey, let's go with Elon Musk. No, let's go with this guy. Let's, let's go with Mark Zuckerberg. You know who Mark Zuckerberg is, right? Facebook guy, right? So Mark Zuckerberg, and you know it's him, right? Because the cell phone says in, in the call ID, real Mark Zuckerberg. So you know it's him. So you pick up the phone, and Mark Zuckerberg is like, hey, I was just looking at your Facebook page. I was just scanning through Facebook and I saw your Facebook page and you know what? I really like your face. So this is what I want to do. I want to hire you. I want, I want to hire you to be, my, to be my personal intern and actually I want to train you to be just as successful as I am in the tech industry. So tomorrow, I'm going to send my personal car with the vice president of my company to come and get you, to bring you on the way to my company, and we're gonna to start tomorrow, and I'm gonna start training you how to be just as successful as me. Can't wait to start, see you tomorrow, click. How do you feel? Thank you for being honest. It's like, it's like I always say, brothers and sisters, I'm not Pentecostal, but I promise you, I'd be moving around every little piece of furniture that was in my house that day because I'd be so excited. I'd be jumping. I'd be elated. Why would I be, why would I be elated? Because, 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 because now I'm rich, right? There's, 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 no, there's still no zeros. In, there's still just zeros in my bank account. Why, why am I elated? Because now I have a PhD? No, because I don't I'm elated because of the one who called. Yes. Are you with me, friend? Listen. I'm elated because of the one who called me. Because I know who called me and who promised me that he was going to train me to be just as successful in the tech industry as him. I know. <laughs> I know. I know that he's successful, and I know that he has all that is necessary to make me just as successful as him. Are you with me, friend? So when God said to Abram, I am the almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. He informs Abram who he is before he calls him to something that he knows it's impossible for him to accomplish by himself. So before he calls Abram to be perfect, he says, you know who's calling you? The Almighty God. One who is perfect and one who is all powerful and is capable of making you perfect too. Doesn't the Bible tell us, go with me to, let's, before we go back to Genesis, go with me to the book of, um, I like this, Go to the book of 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 24. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 24. What's it say there? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse, what verse did I give you? 
In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 24, what does the Bible say there? Faithful is he that? Come on now, friends, it's in your Bibles. Faithful is he that? Call of you. And who will also do it? God is the one that called Abram. Who called us to be perfect in Matthew 5 and verse 48? Jesus. Jesus. Is Jesus God? Yes. yes. So faithful is he that calleth you and who will? Come on, friends. Faithful is he that calleth you and who will also yes. do it? What does the Bible... Is everybody with me so far? Okay. Now let me ask you another question. He sends the car, right? He sends the car, right? And he sends the personal assistant, his, the very vice president, to bring you to him. Are you with me, friends? Listen to the question. He sends the car and the vice president to bring you to him. You had no way to get to him, but he provided the way for you to get to him. What do you call that? You had no way to get to him, but he provided the way for you to get to him. And did you do anything to deserve it? Because you don't have a PhD, you don't know anything about technology, you probably don't even know how to use a mouse. But he said, I like your face, so I'm going to send my car, I'm going to send my vice president, and I'm going to have them bring you on the way to me. Did you do anything to merit it? No. No. It was out of his kindness that he made a way for you. What do you call that? Grace. That's called unmerited favor. Are you with me, friends? God has made provision for us to be perfect like Him. You're not with me, guys. That way is through whom? It's through, that way is through whom? No, no, listen. That way is through whom? That way is through Christ. He says, I am the God and the no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Did we do anything to merit Jesus Christ coming, dying, rising again? Nothing. Jesus is grace. He said, now I'm going to train you. Are you with me, friends? So, and guess what? What is your, when you get to that building, when you get to Facebook headquarters, right? Do they know you? No. If you walk to that door by yourself, they're going to turn you around the same way you did. That's right. But if you come with the vice president, now you've got a title to get in. You're not with me, friends. That's your title. You get the point? But he says, I'm going to train you to be as successful as me. That's your fitness. That's sanctification. Simple? Yes. You get it? Yes. Is it click? What about the little ones in the back? You get it? You get it back there? Let me make it like this. You ain't getting in the building with <laughs> You're not getting in the building without the vice president. They're like, who are you? I don't like you. I don't like your gray shirt. <laughs> but when they see you come with the vice president, they say, oh, they, they, they don't even call you. They don't even say to you, little man. They say, oh, please, sir, come in the building. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying, right? Okay, good. Then they train you because they, now you're being educated to be like the father, right? Right? Okay, you get the point. You all see the point right now? Yes. That's how Jesus is our title. What sanctification is God making us fit for the kingdom of heaven? Now here's the one. Now here's something. Did you prove? Is, is, is you, you being trained? Are you proving anything when you're being trained? You're not proving one thing. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, you're not proving anything. You stepped in the building. And you stepped in the building in a position where you could prove nothing. Do you understand what I just said? Did you get the point? Your fitness is not you proving to God that you're worthy of being in the building. Your fitness is surrendering to the education process so that you are worthy of being in the building. Right? They say to you, listen, you're an imbecile and I know you're an imbecile. <laughs> We're going to put you through training. Every day until you're ready to take the desk. That's the work of the Spirit of God, brothers and sisters. That's sanctification. Do we all get this? 
Little ones, do you understand the point? Okay, good. Title, fitness, justification, sanctification, all of it is still grace. Did we merit any of this? No. Nothing. But you know what? Let me tell you something. When the next day came, if you didn't believe that that phone call was true, and you didn't step outside of the building to jump in the car, nothing would happen. You had to have faith. You had to believe that the one who called you, who promised, was faithful. Are you getting this, friends? Faith takes us every step of the way. Does this make sense? Faith takes you every step of the way. You have to believe in the one that is called you. Now here's a beautiful thing. He says to Abram, <laughs> he says to Abram, walk before me. I like this part because it teaches me a lot. He says, walk before me. This is a 99 year old man and he's literally telling him to take the posture of a child because he's talking about walk before me. When you're teaching, a, you know, you have a little one that can I walk your child? <laughs> yes, that one. I'm just, I'm just trying to sneak in. I'm just trying to get a reason to hold this cute one. <laughs> I'm going to give you back to mom. Real quick. I will never take this little one and say, okay, it's time to walk. Follow me. Right? What do we do? I put it right in, right? Right? Am I right? And then I start doing like this. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. Let's go. Now guess what? Are we moving right now? Are we moving? But is she really walking? Who's really doing all the who's really doing all the work? I'm really the one doing all the work, isn't I? Brothers and sisters, are you getting the point right now? Yes. God says, walk before me. He's telling us to take a position where he's the one that's upholding us. Are you getting the point, friends? Yes. He's the one that's upholding us. Here's the interesting thing. We're the ones, we, we show a willingness just the same way this little one here showed a willingness to experience the movement. So, you know, the little of Jesus, you saw it? You saw the little leg go up? That little leg wasn't taking her anywhere. But you saw the little leg go up. You saw her wheel. Yes. Because I had the hands and I was, she clearly felt that my will was saying, let's go forward. And she went along with my will. Yeah. Are you getting the point right now? But who was really doing all the heavy lifting? Isaiah 41 and verse 10. Let's go there. Isaiah 41 and verse 10. In Isaiah 41 and verse 10. He's so cute. <laughs> Isaiah 41 and verse 10. The Bible says, here it is, friends. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. Yea, I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. So how do we really become partakers of his righteousness? By allowing him to what? Uphold us. We have to fully surrender. Are you with me, friends? We have to fully surrender. Here's another one for you that you all know very well. Jude and verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless. Give me another word for faultless. Perfect. Friends, who's the one that keeps us from falling? Him. It's all about Him. He's the one that strengthens us, enables us. He's the one that upholds us. Brothers and sisters, all we have to do is be willing to do His will. As we say, when the will of man cooperates with the will of God, it becomes... 
Come on, I know I have some Seventh-day Adventists in the room. When the will of God, when the will of man rather, cooperates with the will of God, it becomes omnipotent. Because what we're simply doing is saying, Lord, I surrender to you. And so now God's power can be made manifest in us to move us forward and take us to higher heights than we could ever experience because it's impossible for us to perform one work of righteousness in our own strength. Amen. The Bible is clear in the book of Romans chapter 8. Go there with me quickly. Romans chapter 8. We're coming back to the book of Genesis 17. Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8. Romans the 8th chapter. Romans chapter 8. And we're looking now at verse, ah, it's a good scripture, by the way. Romans 8, and we're looking at verse, yeah, I love it. Verse 3, it says this, for what the law, are we required to keep the law? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. For what the law could not do in that it was we through the flesh. That's a problem. Our flesh is weak. We learned that before in the book of Matthew chapter 26 when Jesus was speaking with the disciples in verse 41 and verse 42 when they were sleeping in the garden of Gethsemane. He said to Peter, you know, listen, watch and pray that she enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his son. He sent his son, made away. God sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. That was him becoming the goat, like you heard about on the Day of Atonement. You know, that's what we see, right? You know, because we know at the end, there's always been the sheep and the what? The sheep and the what? So the very fact, the Bible typifies Jesus as a goat on the Day of Atonement, letting us know that he was made sin for us. Who knew no sin? He died the second death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, what did he do? He condemned sin in the flesh. He took it down. Why? That the righteousness of the law, the right requirements of the law, might be what? Fulfilled in us. Might be performed in and through us who walk not after our weak flesh, but after the what, friends? The Spirit. So it's the Spirit of God that enables us, that strengthens us, so that we can advance forward day by day, day by day, day by day in the will of God. This is how we have this experience as we trust in the Lord that He will uphold us with His righteousness. That's righteousness by faith. I partake of Christ's righteousness as I exercise faith in Him as capable of changing me and able to actually make me like Him. Ah, oh, my Lord. It's just that simple, friends. Here we go again. So He says, walk before me and be thou perfect. Let me give you another scripture before we close this up this evening. Go again with me in your Bibles. I want you to go, if you will, with me to the book of Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. And let's look at verse 24, I believe it is. Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 24. Matthew, Mark. Mark chapter 4, looking at verse 24. You know, this is just some really, really, really clear, if I can, to my mind, illustrations of this issue of us just growing in the will of God and experiencing this perfection that the Lord calls all of us to. In Mark chapter 4 and verse 26. Are you there with me in your Bibles? I said I gave you the wrong scripture. Don't worry. Mark 4 verse 26. That's the right one if I gave you the wrong one. You have the right one now? Yeah. Now listen to this. It says, So is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day and the seed should spring and grow up he knoweth not how. Now, most of you here have at one point in time, planted a seed, some type of seed. Right? Am I right? Yes. Okay. Now, it makes no difference how much you went to the store to get the best heirloom seeds or, or you know, you put the pot in the window or you had made sure you had the best area where the sunlight was beaming on it and you made sure you, you, you know, you cultivated your soil, there was no rocks there, etc., etc., etc. You might have done all those things to ensure that you're going to have a good harvest or whatever you planted. But the reality is, you have no knowledge as to how that seed grew. You with me, friend? I don't care. 
I don't care what you say. All you did was you prepared the soil. You did do that. Yeah, you made sure that it was placed with sunlight and everything to get to it. But friends, you didn't make one thing grow. Right? Yeah. Just like it said here. The farmer can plant the seed. He can rise night and day. In other words, he can rise night and day and go out into the field and look. But one day, he's going to rise up and he's going to go out there. What will he see? Something grown up out of the ground and he doesn't even know how it happened. Now, if there's a process that you can't explain, give me a word to describe it. It's a one word. One word. Mystery. It's a what? So the Bible is using the growth of the seed to give us a very clear working example of the mystery of godliness. How divinity can develop in humanity. How God can dwell in humanity. This is not something that anyone can fully explain. That is why the science of the cross is something that we're going to study throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. That's why Jesus, when he was speaking to Nicodemus in his midnight meeting with him. All of you are familiar with it. And Nicodemus, he told Nicodemus, yeah, I know you're coming here and you're saying all these nice things to me. Nicodemus, you got to be born again. And Nicodemus said, what are you talking about? I'm, I mean, I'm going to go back into my mother's womb? He said, you're, you're a teacher in Israel and you don't know these things? You know, it's funny, but there's a lot of teachers in Israel and they don't know these things, friends. And then he goes on to explain. Just look at it with me quickly, if you will. Go with me in your Bibles. Let's go to the book of John quickly. John chapter 3. We'll go back over to the book of um, Mark in a second. But John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, and we'll look at verse 7. John chapter 3, beginning at verse 7. And it's beautiful because he's talking about the kingdom of God once again. The same thing that we're looking at over there in Mark chapter 4. There's no two kingdoms of God. There's only one kingdom of God. So here we are, Mark, in John chapter 3, John chapter 3, looking at verse 7, it says, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listed. Now here's the sound thereof, but you can't not tell from whence it comes or where it go. If you don't know where it came from or where it's going, what do you call that again? Mystery. Mystery. But then it goes, on, it goes on to say, even so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So the work of the Spirit of God in the heart of an individual like yourself to make you into a new creature. My friends, it is a mystery. It's a mystery. However, do you see the wind when it's blowing? Do you see the trees moving by the wind? Yes or no? When a blade is coming up out of the ground, do you see that? Yes? So even though you can't fully explain the process, it is observable. For instance, oh Lord have mercy. I showed my brothers a picture of me before I really, really knew Jesus. I don't look like the same man. Now it's still a mystery to me. Are you understanding what I'm saying, friends? It's a mystery. I can't explain it all, but God does it. And I'm sure the same is true for each one of you in here, that there are those that knew you and then they see you and they say, who are you? talking different. You've got different goals, aims, aspirations. You used to be different. That's the work of the Spirit. It's a mystery, but it is observable, friends. And then the Bible tells us, go back to the book of Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. So don't think, and I make this statement, don't think that everything pertaining to divinity working in humanity is something that we can write down an equation for. There's no E equals MC squared when it comes to the mystery of godliness. It is just us by faith believing. Listen, Christ can come and live within me and make me into a new creature. I believe it because he said it and that's the end of the story. Are you with me, friends? Okay. And then the Bible says in Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 4, that's how I have to go one step further with this, please. I have to say one. That's why when people come to you, I want you to hear this thing. Don't ever feel, you know, <laughs> atheists like to come to Christians and browbeat us. And I realize they like, you get browbeaten, we get browbeaten by atheists because they use words that you think are fancy and impressive. And it's really a bunch of nonsense, really, because they're using big words to explain their stupidity. 
right? Just because all I know is you're an intellectual fool, according to the Bible. Are you with me, friends? Yeah. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So I don't care if you're a PhD level, PhD level fool or low level fool. A fool is a fool. <laughs> fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So they come to you and they try to question your Christianity. They say, oh, how do you know this thing? <laughs> right? And, and, you, and you start feeling like, oh, Lord, how do I explain it? Oh, God. What's wrong with you? Brothers and sisters, you know, there's some point you can get look and look directly at them and say, you know what? I'm going to tell you right now, I can't fully explain the whole thing to you. But one thing I do know is this. The person that I was before, I'm not today. It's because of Jesus. And you know what the Bible says? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I've got a milkshake over there. I'm not sharing it with you, but I'm telling you it's good. You want some, go get your own. You're not getting what I'm talking about. You really want to know if God is real? Go find out for yourself. If you really want to know. I had to find out for myself. I had to taste and see that he was good for myself. God didn't say we can, we can prove him by, we can't prove him by argumentation. We invite people to taste and see that he is good. Are you with me, friends? Oh, come on. Stop feeling daunted by these things. Then you do that. Now you, so now you go, look. Next time they talk to you, taste and see for this. <laughs> Just telling you. Tell them taste and see. We're back in Mark chapter 4. Are you with me, friends? In Mark chapter 4, it goes on to say this. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. First the blade, then the air, then the full corn in the air. Is that a development process? Yes or no? Excellent. So we see, we see something going from one stage to the next stage until it is full of age or fully ripened, complete. Am I right? Yes. Okay. Now, here's the question. Some of you know where I'm going right now. I'm going there still. Let's, think, let's imagine that I have a seed in my hand. It's a corn seed. And it has all the genetic information in it that if I put it in the proper environment, it will develop to be a full stalk of corn. Question, is that corn seed perfect or imperfect? Answer? Okay, correct answer. Why is it perfect? Good. It is perfect in that state. It's exactly what it's supposed to be in that state for that time, correct? Yes. Good. You put the corn seed in the ground, you go to sleep, you wake up three days later, boop, there's a blade that shoots up out of the ground. If you blow on it, it will probably fall over. Perfect or imperfect? Why? Exactly what it's supposed to be at that state of its development. And so on and so forth until you have a full swap of Corn, brothers and sisters, that is the work of sanctification. In other words, for the Christian, we can be perfect at every state of our development in Christ. At every state, we can be growing in Jesus and he can look at us and say, that one is perfect, that one is perfect, that one is perfect. Interesting enough, this one could be at a different stage of development from this one, but as long as they're at the point of development that God has called them to, they're still perfect in the sight of God. Amen. Isn't that powerful? So, that's, so that makes it say, stop looking at this person and looking at that person. Fix your eyes on Jesus because he's the son of righteousness. And plants only grow when the sun is coming on them, friends. You know how it Plants don't grow by turning themselves to other plants. Hey, man. Hey. Now, plants grow by plants grow, they point towards the sun. Have you ever been out in nature? Literally, you see that plants in some areas they'll bend this direction because that's the way the sun is coming from. But most of us over here like this. What's wrong with us? That's the reason why we're not growing. Because we're so busy looking at this one and that one, and he ain't doing it. Look at him. We're not going to grow like that, friends. We have to keep our eyes fixed on the Son of Righteousness. If you're with me, say amen. amen. It's all about Jesus. Every step of the way. 
And here's the beauty of this. Now let me explain a little bit more so that we can really be extremely practical with this. Okay? So, let me talk about you because if I talk about me, it gets a little crazy. So, let's say when you, let's say, you're in the world and you're a horrible person. <laughs> you're just a total wretch. You're a wretch. A wretched wretch. And you, you smoke, you're drinking, you're, you're, you're living with somebody that's not your, your husband or your wife. You're, you're, you're doing all the things you know you're not supposed to be doing. You, you know what I'm talking about, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? Yes. Okay. And then the Lord comes knocking on your heart's door. And you know it's God. And God is like, my child, it's time to live a different life. And you're like, Lord, you know what? I want to live a different life. I want to live a different life. And then the Lord says, okay, give me your drinking, give me your foul language, give me your smoking. And you say, Lord, I surrender. Amen. You're perfect. You're perfect. You're exactly what God wants you to be at that stage of your development. Now, there's a whole lot of other corruption in your life that we haven't gotten to yet, but God hasn't gotten to it with you as of yet. You're not listening, friends. Are you listening? You're perfect. If you were to drop dead at that hour, you'd go to the kingdom of that. You're perfect. Because what you have displayed is you are willing to surrender your will to the will of God. You're perfect. Tomorrow comes, and God says, I want you to stop watching those programs on Netflix that you're watching. You're like, but I'm in the middle of this series. And God's like, and that's where the series stops. <laughs> and you're like, all right, Lord, you know what? I'm done. No more worldly entertainment. I've given up the music and the movies. I'm done. You know what you are, right? Perfect. Now, the, now brothers and sisters, God didn't tell you about all the other garbage that's back here, because I promise you, there's a lot back there. Yes. Are you with me, friends? Yes. But he's dealing with you step by step. Why? Because his objective is not to destroy you, it's to grow you. Amen. Yes. Are you with me, friends? Yes. Now, Dave, the next time he comes to you, you're like, yes, God. He's like, it's time for you to, it's time for you to get out of that house with that person that you're living with that's not your, that's not your spouse. Yes. And you're like, Lord, but how? Where am I going to live? They, they pay for everything for me. <laughs> I don't even know how to make sense of for myself. <laughs> Are you with me, friends? <laughs> and, and now, and now, here come the excuses. And you're like, well, Lord, okay, when, as soon as I, as soon as, as soon as I, as soon as I get this and do that, and, and when I get that call, then, what's happening right now, friends? You're not perfect. You know why? And you're not, you're not doing what? You're not surrendering. Because remember, God's biddings are His enablings. God ain't calling you out for no reason. You have to believe and say, okay, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to leave because you want me to leave and I'm also going to trust that you're going to provide something else for me. Yes. Friends, what I'm saying is, is this is, and this is what our experiences, most of our experiences look like. You know, many of us, we start this process. We actually, st please hear this point out. This is exactly the reason why the teaching that we cannot be perfect finds a seat in the church. It has nothing to do with what God can do. People are basing their doctrinal belief off of their personal experiences. Did you hear what I said? Because here's the, here's the point. There's a lot of us that used to use foul language before we came to Jesus, and the foul language most of the time goes out the window pretty quickly. Am I right? Okay, oh, I don't know. I'm nice to be you, you, you stop the foul language quickly. You stop the drinking. You stop the smoking. And those things are you growing in Jesus Christ. Am I right? But then God comes to something in your life 
that is actually more of a covenant sin. It's a bigger idol. It's an obstacle. It's something that... <laughs> and we don't progress forward because we don't want to. We don't want to surrender. And because we don't want to surrender, and we don't find a way around this thing, then that's when people say, well, then being perfect can't be possible. And you're really basing that off of man's reluctance to surrender. It has nothing to do with God's ability. Because if God was able to transform you to stop speaking foul language, to stop drinking liquor, to stop smoking cigarettes, he can help you with that other thing too if we just give it to him. But we don't give it to him. You know why we don't give it to him? Because it's as painful as plucking out the eye, cutting off the hand, chopping off the foot. You don't know what I'm talking about? He says, if your eye offends you, better to go on the kingdom blind. Because we have some sins in our life that we have practiced for so long, we actually identify with those sins as being a part of who we are. So to give them up is like poking out your eye or cutting off your hand. Let's, am I speaking the truth right now? Yes. Have you ever seen some people that are just like, well, I have to give you my mind, peace be. That's who I am. I know that's who you are. You know, Jesus is trying to give you victory over who you are. The kingdom of heaven is not, us, it's not about us being who we are. It's about us being who Jesus wants us to be. And so the word of God says, I'm closing now. The word of God says, first of all, then the air, then the cool corner of the air. Brothers and sisters, we can grow and we can consistently grow. Is it a process? Yes. Is there a conflict? Yes. But every man that strives for the mastery must be tempered in all things. God never told us that there wouldn't be a conflict. He says, so run I not as one that is uncertain. I don't fight as one that's beating the air. He said, matter of fact, he says, know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize, so run that you may obtain. In other words, simple language. He says, you know when you see a race going down, if there's a marathon, I was just talking about this with the brothers the other day. You know if there's a marathon, there's a thousand, two thousand people like the New York Marathon. There's thousands of people in the New York Marathon. Thousands! But only one person is going to win that gold medal. And that one person that's going to win that gold medal knows that they have to outlast and outstrike everybody else so that they can capture the gold. God says the same, the same type of intensity and discipline and dedication and striving that that person exerts to obtain the gold medal, I want you to do that for the kingdom of heaven. Like you're the only one that can get the crown of life. And most of us don't want to do that. But he's going to ask them, sir. Last scriptures. I have, I think, three last ones for you. Go with me, Matthew, to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 4, and we're looking at verse 29. The Bible says, but when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he put it in the sickle. Why? Because the heart is come. Friends, this is pointing to the second coming of Jesus. If you go with me to the book of Revelation chapter 14, we'll see this. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation 14, we're beginning at verse 14. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 14. What verse did I give you? We're ending now, so you can, you, you can take a deep breath. Revelation 14, looking at verse 14. The Bible says, And I looked, and behold, a, one, a white cloud. And upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And verse 15 says, And another angel came out of the temple, Crying with a loud voice to him that's out of the cloud, saying, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. This is Christ's Object Lessons, page 69. You know this one by heart. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he shall come to claim them as his own. 
when the work of sanctification is completed in us, when the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced in us, when he can look down on this earth in this great controversy and say, have you considered my servants? He's coming to save us. Final scripture. James chapter 4. James chapter 5, verse 7. James 5, verse 7. James 5, verse 7. I love these scriptures, actually. I'm going, to be, I'm going to go 7 and 8 tonight. It says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. How many of you want to see Jesus come? I know I want to see him. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, we've been going through some hard times. Harder times are ahead. I know that some of you are smiling and enjoying yourself while you're at this prayer retreat because you're not at home right now. Am I telling the truth? You don't, no, don't even, don't even, don't even, don't even, don't even respond to that one. Some of you are, some of you are, some of you are here just, some of you are just escaping home right now. No, it's, this life is hard. This life is not easy. We've got people, we, some of us here are probably sick, haven't even let anybody know. We've got family members that are sick, we've got bills that we've got to go back to, problems we have to deal with. There's a whole lot going on in this life, trials that are just crippling to the individual that doesn't have hope in Jesus. But God says, listen, be patient, therefore, brother. Be patient, therefore, brother, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband man waited for the precious fruit of the earth. And have long patience for it until it received the early and the latter rain. And you know this, the early rain is that rain that causes the germination of the seed. It begins to grow. The latter rain is that final rain that falls, that brings the grain, brings the crop to, to full age, if you will, prepared for harvesting, friends. And God says he's waiting for us to receive the early and the latter rain. Friends, first of all, if God says he's waiting for us to receive the early and the latter rain, that means that most of us in here have yet to be converted. We haven't even started the transformation. We haven't even... We haven't even really allowed the Spirit to do his work in our lives. You think about this, friends. The disciples walked with Jesus in the direct presence of Jesus, working miracles. Not only did Jesus work miracles, he gave them the power to work miracles, and they still weren't converted. You do know that, don't you? When Jesus sent them out two by two, they weren't even converted, and they were working miracles. You know why God would give them such power? It was an invitation for them to experience something greater in their own lives. That's why he said to them, you think all this stuff that you guys are doing is amazing? What you should really rejoice about is that your names are written in heaven. Amen. I'm just trying to let you know I have greater things for you. Brothers and sisters, Listen, I know for myself, running around the world preaching and all this stuff doesn't mean one thing. It's wonderful, but it doesn't mean anything. I must be converted. You must receive the early rain. And he says, I'm waiting for you to receive both the early and the latter rain. Friends, we are here talking about we can't wait to see Jesus. And Jesus is saying, I can't wait to see myself in you. Because as soon as I see my reflection in you, I'm coming to get you. You know why I like the next scripture? God says, I'm being patient with you, though. Praise the Lord that he's being patient with us. Amen? Look what he says in verse 8. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord draw nigh. What a fitting scripture. It says, be also patient. In other words, God says, I'm being patient with you for, you for you to allow me to work in you. I need you to be patient with me. 
You're not listening to me, friend. I need you to be patient with me as I'm working out my will in your life. Establish your hearts will your anchor hold. Because the coming of the Lord draweth not. Is your heart established in Jesus? Are you patiently cooperating with him to do his perfect will in your life? Friends, it doesn't happen overnight. Patiently endure. You have to be patient with the Lord. Because he knows what he's doing. And I pray that each one of us will walk before him and be perfect. It's, this, it's your desire this evening to say, Lord, I want to surrender my heart to you. I want to ask, invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. If it's, if it's your desire this evening to say, Lord, I want to surrender my heart to you. As I heard your word this evening, the Spirit of God has spoken to me, and I do understand that there is a work that you are trying to do in my life, and Lord, I want you to do it in my life. I believe that there is power in Jesus for me to be a new creature. I believe the Almighty God will both work, work, will birth, will both work in me to will and to do of his good pleasure. In other words, you know what? I know that God can save me. I want to give my heart to him. I really want to surrender my entire heart to Jesus so that he can perfect his will in my life. Friends, if you haven't really made that decision, if you haven't really surrendered your heart to Christ, I'm asking you in the back, let's just kill the conversations. Brothers and sisters, we're in the church of the living God. Let's kill the conversations. Let's not be those individuals that are used by Satan to distract somebody from hearing the voice of God speak to them. Let's just let God speak. We're just here for one more day. Can we let God speak? Just let God speak. If you'd like to say, Lord, I want to give you my heart. I'm tired of running from you. I'm tired of backpedaling. I'm tired of trying to quiet your convictions. I know you're calling, up, calling me higher. And tonight, I believe that you can make me perfect. If you believe that and you want to make that commitment, would you come down front this evening? I'd like to say a word of prayer with you. That's if you believe that, if you want that experience. Don't worry about what anybody else is doing. That's a personal decision. You don't have to come. Please don't come. If you're not ready to make a decision, don't come because somebody's looking. Come because the Spirit of God has told you to come and you're saying, Lord, I'm coming. I am coming. I know I want the experience. I want it. I want it. It's my prayer. You know what? I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm going to make another appeal that has not been made, but I'm going to make that appeal this evening. If God is leading, let him lead. There may be someone, and I just ask if you're here, just bow your heads, close your eyes. You're praying for yourself, you're praying for others. You're, listen, friends, we're in a real warfare. The devil is trying to destroy people. He's trying to destroy you. He's trying to destroy me. And if we can't come to a venue like this and pray for one another, then what's the purpose of us coming to a prayer retreat? It's not to eat good food and have good fellowship. It's for us to come closer to Jesus. And every other thing is just peripheral. Here's my final appeal. There may be someone here tonight that has not given their heart wholly to Jesus before. And you want to say, Lord, I want to be a child of the living God, and I would like to receive Bible studies that will prepare me for baptism. There's somebody here that has not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and as their Savior fully, and you would like to receive Bible studies so that you can go forward to that next step of entering into the war we with Christ and rising up in the newness of life, moving forward in His will. If you would like those Bible studies to prepare you for baptism, just raise your hand. Is there anyone that would like to make that decision this evening that hasn't made that decision for Jesus as of yet? See, why are we looking around, friends? We should pray. 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 It's not your decision. If it's your decision, you make it. If you're not making that, then pray for us. Then let somebody else make that decision. Does somebody here want to make that decision? You can't raise the hand for somebody. You People have to raise their hands for themselves. God bless. God bless you. Praise the Lord.
Let's pray and ask God to seal up our decisions that we have made. Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm so thankful that in Jesus Christ we can be more than conquerors. I'm thankful that your word is as a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our paths. And I know that there is power available for all of us to live our lives as new creatures in Christ. Please work with us, Lord. We're people that are struggling, but Father, we're committing ourselves to fight the good fight, even unto the death if necessary. But we do not want to miss out on being in the kingdom of heaven with you. Our desire is not the pearly gates. It's not the foundations made out of precious jewels, not the mansion or the crown. Our desire is to be with Jesus, Lord. So help us, dear God, for we are weakness, but you promised that you would hold us with the right hand of your righteousness. So into your hands we place our lives. Save us, we pray, in the name of Jesus. We ask this blessing. Amen. Amen. God bless.
Uh, we're going to pray now. Uh, before we leave this place, uh, is it okay if I ask uh, my sister, um, Sister Martha, would you mind coming down um, to just pray for everybody that we leave this auditorium? Uh, the devil will not destroy us. See, Satan is waiting to steal away those convictions. And if we allow ourselves to be careless, by the time we get to the chalice, we probably have forgotten the decisions that we were making here. So shall we um, adapt the reverend to our position? And this is the Oh, baby, 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 